500 now. <laughs> and everybody making a web application, well, not a web application, anybody making a distributed application that talks through a socket invents their own protocol. <laughs> Which is crazy, actually. It's all Postel's fault. He invented the first one. He invented the, um, the email protocol. You know, it sent back sort of 400 something and 200 OK when you sent email. And then everybody's followed him ever since. I have colleagues who work and they say, oh yeah, but these text protocols are XML, they're really good. You can see what's on the line. And I said, but look, excuse me, what's on the line are electrons that are bouncing up and down. Of course you can't see them, you know, don't be daft. You see what the program decides to print out, having analysed what those electrons moving up and down mean. Okay, so why stuff that you're not supposed to be seen should be human readable is a mystery that uh, I don't understand, actually. Well, I do, it's because you tell net to debug it, but that was 1965 or something? Yeah, I don't know. What is the thing? Uh, we actually need languages to describe encodings and not machine instructions. You see, the programming language we have today, they describe machine instructions, only they do it in different ways. I mean, Erlang, C, C sharp, C sharp, C plus plus, Haskell, they describe what a virtual machine does to some sort of abstract model of the world. Okay. We don't want to do it. There are loads of them. We don't want more of them. Not fewer of them. It's just confusing at the moment. But we do want ways to describe what's going on um, between machines. And there are a few languages. Um, if you think about it, there are generic protocols. Um, generic means there's a sort of universal parser you can use. You don't have to write the parser. And there's a grammar. So the one that is most widely used is XML. It's XML, you have XML files, you have a grammar, and you have parsers and just off-the-shelf things. Pop the grammar in, um, and off you go. So that's actually quite a good idea. Uh, XML is, of course, terribly verbose, and why anybody would want to read it by hand, I have no idea. So I, I don't think it's a wonderful <laughs> idea. Um, uh, there are also like binary protocols like ASM1, which also have grammars, which is widely used in the telecoms industry too package binary data. And then, of course, there are thousands of different ad hoc protocols that describe file structures. Uh, that's a very, very bad idea. Um, see, I suppose it started off in the 70s as a good idea. Um, applications can, can work on the same data by exchanging files. So like got JPEG files and GIF files, and that's OK. There's only two or three different file types. Now there are thousands and thousands and thousands of file types, and you can't actually exchange them. Um, you can see, actually, the catastrophic failure of connecting components together in the rise of the apps. You know, the, the, when, when smartphones came along, they offered a different model of, of distributing software. The app. You know, the app and the iPhone started this. They statically linked all the code for everything you needed into one application, and it couldn't share data with the other application. Right. And that was because everybody completely buggered up how you connect things together. So the answer to that is just to stick them all in one great big bundle and not let them interact with anything else. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. In fact, it's lost this dream of just making components that we can connect together. And that's because we weren't able to make components that we could connect together. OK, so the next 10 years of research has got to be into how we connect things together. Thank you, I guess, sir. Right. <coughs> so this is actually how I think you should connect things together. Um, so I've, I've implemented this. Uh, normally you talk about clients and servers, as if there are two things in an architecture. Um, so I'm adding a third thing. Um, it's not a client and it's not a server. It's a contract checker, which you place on a communication line between communicating components. And you give that a contract, and the contract tells you in a formal sense, um, you know, if you send me one of them, I want one of them back. And so a contract checker has a finite state machine describing allowable protocols and a type system so that it can ascertain what the types of the things are on, on the channels. And actually, some sort of language like Tony Horse CSP is the sort of language you would want for the contract. And that's where I actually started way back 
you know, when I, when I first invented Erlang, I really wanted to make something that looked like uh, Tony Hall's CSP, but I didn't, couldn't see how to do it then. In fact, because I was looking at the wrong part of the problem. So, so now I think we can build, well, I'm going to show Anybody interested in this stuff? I think before. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mr. Erlang. He, 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 he was a Danish mathematician. And, uh, does anybody know what the Erlang is? If you have a telephone line and it's used 100% of the time, then it carries a traffic of one airline. And it's used uh, in traffic theory. So if you could say, well, if I've got telephone lines here and they have a traffic of two air, you know, half an airline, what's the probability that if I wait for more than 10 minutes and, and I don't get a, a line, if the average holding time is four minutes? Mr. Airline worked out, Agnar Carrara can work out all the maths for that. Statistician. Language. This was about airline. Um, How's, how are we doing for time? Well, of course. Well, so, how many people have learned to Erlang? Oh, we'll skip this picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. There's, we've seen all this stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> So last week, now, now I'm going to sort of do something which my people say you should never do. Never show them the code you wrote last week or on the train. Um, so I discovered a long thread on the Alec mailing list at the moment called Beautiful Code, so, uh, which I started, and, uh, discussing a programming technique which sort of struck me as being rather beautiful last week. And I, I just thought, oh, that's very beautiful. And I got it to work, so I'll show you. So, for a long time, if you look at the program on the left, uh, this is uh, actually that program. I always thought was the most beautiful airline program you could write. So that one's not bad. Um, that one's actually more beautiful. I call that program Become. And Become, you start a Become process, and it gets sent to a function, and then it applies the function. That's it. So it becomes. <coughs> whatever you want. So I use become, well think of it like this. The normal web architecture, you start something which is a web server and you put plugins in, in it to sort of make it change its behavior. So I thought, well what if you step back a stage, why don't you start something that only has the ability to, to read a socket? And then you tell it to become a web server or an FTP server or whatever, a Git server, you know. You put the plug-in into the generic thing that tells it to become an Apache or tells it to become a Git server. Let's back off one stage. So I wrote that. And, and the reason I wrote that was I was working with Planet Lab. Planet Lab is a distributed system with, I don't know, 14, 1,500 computers all around the world. And... Uh, uh, that's where I had a research just happen on And I thought, oh, I've got, we can write a distributed application running on 1,000 machines. What do I do? I don't know. I couldn't actually think of what to do with it. So I just put this become program on every single machine. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, it's running. You know. Now all I have to do is send it functions and it will do it. And then I had to write a paper for a conference. And, oh, oh, I know, I'll write a content distribution network. So I... I there's something called um, the, the gossip protocol. Do you know what the gossip protocol is? How to spread information? You gossip to your neighbours. You know, I gossip to you, and you gossip to your neighbours. And so it's, it's, um, this spreads the information in the network very quickly. So I wrote a gossip algorithm that just squirted it out to all the nodes and then just sort of sent some files around it. Or <laughs> just filled the network. <laughs> right, BitTorrent, only a lot better. Another program that's very nice is the, the forever, the, the, the second program, the loop that uh, it just sits in a loop and you send it a function, it evaluates the function, then it goes back and waits for the next message. Ah, that's a very beautiful program. 
Why are these beautiful programs? Because they're so minimal. They don't do anything. I mean, they're just they're generic. They're generic. You only got to write this once. And then last week I started thinking about, well, could you write exactly the same program in JavaScript? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Um, with WebSockets. And WebSockets are pure, proper sockets with asynchronous communication, uh, which are implemented in HTML5 and which work on Chrome, Chromium and uh, Safari, have been turned off for security reasons in Firefox. Uh, 